It is day 201 of our 365 the Bible year days. So I know my Bible's kind of small, but we're like, you know, this is where we're at. We're two thirds, almost two thirds of the way through. Coming up on the New Testament soon. If you've drifted away from reading, that is okay. I want to invite you to come back. Uh, we're in the prophetic text. We don't spend enough time in the prophetic text as a church, so we're really digging into them. And if you have questions, if there's things you'd like to talk about, we have a couple small groups that can help you do that. So I hope you'll come or, or we can help you start another small group to have these conversations. But this week finds us in the prophetic text of Jeremiah, and I'll be reading from chapter 1, verses 4 through 10, chapter 3, verses 6 through 14, both from the Common English Bible. The Lord's word came to me. Before I created you in the womb, I knew you. Before you were born, I set you apart. I made you a prophet to the nations. Oh, Lord God, I said, I don't know how to speak because I'm only a child. The Lord responded, don't say I'm only a child. Where I send you, you must go. What I tell you, you must say. Don't be afraid of them because I'm with you to rescue you, declares the Lord. Then the Lord stretched out his hand, touched my mouth and said to me, I'm putting my words in your mouth. This very day, I appoint you over nations and empires to dig up and pull down, to destroy and demolish, to build and plant. From chapter three. During the rule of King Josiah, the Lord said to me, have you noticed what unfaithful Israel has done? She's gone about looking for lovers on top of every high hill and under every lush tree. I thought that after she had done all this, she would return to me, but she didn't. Her disloyal sister Judah saw this. She also saw that I sent unfaithful Israel away with divorce papers because of all her acts of unfaithfulness. Yet disloyal sister Judah was not afraid, but kept on playing the prostitute. She didn't think twice about corrupting the land and committing adultery with stone and tree. Yet even after all this, disloyal sister Judah didn't return to me with all her heart, but only insincerely, declares the Lord. Then the Lord said to me, unfaithful Israel is less guilty than disloyal Judah. Go proclaim these words to the north and say, return unfaithful Israel, declares the Lord. I won't reject you for I am faithful, declares the Lord. I won't stay angry forever, only acknowledge your wrongdoing, how you have rebelled against the Lord your God and given yourself to strangers under every lush tree and haven't obeyed me, declares the Lord. Return rebellious children, declares the Lord, for I'm your husband. I'll gather you one from a city and two from a tribe and bring you back to Zion. Here ends the reading. Spirit of God, stir up your people. Thanks be to God. I was first called to preach after sharing my testimony at an Easter sunrise service my junior year of high school. At least that's how I start my call story, because as you're going through the process to become an ordained elder in the United Methodist Church, you have to get really good at sharing your call story and you have to distill it down to a quick share. But that's not actually where my call story starts, right? It's never that simple. Because the testimony that I was sharing on that Easter sunrise service was the testimony of my salvation experience. And my salvation experience had happened between my sophomore and junior year of high school. And what had happened was I was in Ohio visiting my mother's extended family and they lived on this dead end street in the middle of nowhere and at the top of the dead end was the house of my great aunt and my great uncle and they had family all along this drive and because it was enclosed and in the middle of nowhere we were given a lot more latitude than we were normally given having grown up in Sioux City right and so I was walking back to the room I was staying in at my great aunt and uncle's house at midnight and I found myself in this clearing and it looked like the beginning of a horror movie and I was ready for the werewolf to pop out and come chase me down. But instead what happened was that the clouds broke and the stars appeared and I felt loved and precious 
and somehow also insignificant. And I hit my knees and I prayed and I had the language to call that experience God and Jesus and to say yes to that experience because before my salvation experience was growing up in the United Methodist Church, St. James United Methodist Church in Sioux City. And I found myself there because of Bucky and Larry Crabb inviting my parents to come to worship with them when my parents moved back to Sioux City when I was six months old. And they knew my parents already because my dad had worked for them before he left to live in Minnesota. And my mother said yes to going to United Methodist Church because she had grown up in a United Methodist Church. And the reason that she grew up in a United Methodist Church is because my grandmother married my grandfather, who was a Presbyterian and a United Methodist by raising, even though my grandmother was brought up Pentecostal and Baptist. And so she made this shift over. And, and, and actually, I should clarify, my grandfather was not United Methodist because he didn't exist until 1968. So he was Methodist Episcopal is the church that my mother went to. But they were invited to this St. James United Methodist Church, which had been a Evangelical United Brethren Church, with the, which again, right, my mother would have never gone to because... She would have stuck with Methodist Episcopal, but since we're all United Methodists now, now it all doesn't matter, we're all the same. Rather than going to the large Grace United Methodist Church that was much closer to the house I grew up in. But even in the midst of all that, after my parents saying yes to us going to church, there were, there were people who said yes to being Sunday school teachers. People who put up with my attitude, and if you've met my daughter, you've met my attitude, right? People who, who got me to memorize the Lord's Prayer despite my attitude. People who taught me how to read the Bible. People who dealt with me in middle school, teaching me confirmation and the history of John Wesley, even though none of us could care less about the history of John Wesley because we were eighth graders at that time, and yet they kept working with us. People who kept teaching me and saying yes to me and welcoming me in their spaces, even though I informed them in no uncertain terms that I did not believe in God anymore because my grandparents had died and what kind of God takes my favorite people away. People who kept me coming to Sunday school, my parents and Donna Podorf, who kept me coming to Sunday school my freshman and sophomore year of high school when I was still, still a skeptic and I would show up half asleep in sweatpants and sit on the couch and fall asleep half the time in Sunday school. And yet Donna kept saying yes and kept insisting that I come back. And it was Donna who asked me to preach that Easter Sunday morning after I came back and told her my testimony of finally saying, okay, I buy this God and Jesus Christ thing you've been telling me about this whole time. And after I preached, it was Reverend Ken Peterson who said, you have a call to preach and had to listen to me go, dude, Jesus and I just met again. I'm not ready to work for him, right? And, and kind of laugh it off. And it was Reverend Bernie Colorado who, when he first met me after he took over for Ken, who looked at me and said, I heard you're the one that's called to preach. And when Bernie met my resistance, he, he went around my resistance and he said, I heard you like preaching. If you want to preach in my pulpit, you have to take a lay speaking class. And that's actually where I met Reverend Lynette, who used to serve here before I got here, right? It's a small world after all. And where I met Reverend Tom Schinkel, who taught an evangelism class for me and then who encouraged me to apply to be the youth leader at my church. And it was Bernie who said yes to me being the youth leader, even though I was a 20 20-year-old college student that lived 45 minutes away and would have to commute in. And it was Bernie who answered my email when I said, okay, what if you're right about this call to ministry thing? And it was the SPRC that said yes to me, even though I wasn't even 21 yet. And it was the district committee on our day ministry who said yes to me, even though when I met with them, I was like, I've been told I have this call. I don't know what that means. I'm not sure what I'm doing. And it was Reverend Steve Pullman who invited me to be involved in clinical pastoral education between college and seminary, and who said, we almost never say yes, but you might as well apply. And he and his team said yes, even though I felt like just a scared kid, and my first introduction to ministry education was walking into a hospital room saying, hi, I'm the chaplain, and the woman saying, I don't do that religious crap, go away. And I ran away. <laughs> 
yes, ma'am. And I ran back to Steve Pullman's office and I said, nope, I am not called to this. And he said, yes, you are, go again. Why am I telling you this? Because I sincerely believe that each and every one of us in this room is called to ministry. Maybe not set apart preaching ministry like I said yes to, but we're called to a ministry as outlined by our membership vows through prayers, presence, gifts, service, witness. Today we read in the prophetic text of Jeremiah about Jeremiah, who we think was a teenager when he was called to preach from God. This, so when he says, I'm a child, he's being literal. He's being literally, I am a child. And God looks at him and says, not only will you preach on my behalf, but you are gonna preach to kings and empires. And when we read about Jeremiah's words that he's called to speak on behalf of God, it's not an easy journey. And Jeremiah fights God the entire way. There are frequently times where Jeremiah's like, I can't say that to people. And God says, yes, you can. And Jeremiah says it, God's word becomes a fire in his bones. He cannot say no. And if you've ever talked to anyone else that's been called to set apart ministry, most of us have an experience of saying no. But all of us are called to ministry and all of us have probably had the experience of wanting to say no to what we're called to because it sounds scary, it sounds overwhelming. We have no idea if it's even gonna be effective. And so our first response is, I don't wanna do that. But like Jeremiah, we have no idea how much potential our yes has. Jeremiah probably could not imagine that thousands and thousands and thousands of years later, we here at Broadway United Methodist Church would be reading his words and talking about his call. All he could do is say yes and be faithful. When I was six months old, Larry and Bucky Crabb, who've continued to be really good friends of our family, probably weren't probably didn't ask my mom and my dad and myself to come to church with the idea in mind that someday I would be preaching down here at Council Bluffs Broadway. The first time I met Reverend Lynette, we couldn't imagine that I would follow her at one of her local churches that she had served at. And yet, all of these yeses that people answered, all of this, yes, I will invite them to church. Yes, I will teach this class. Yes, I will serve on this committee. Yes, I will give money to St. James United Methodist Church so that we can have a Sunday school and a youth program. Yes, I will teach third graders how to write out the Lord's Prayer, even though they don't care about it at the moment. Yes, I'll keep showing up in this. Our high school classroom probably broke like a thousand fire codes because it was technically a converted closet with some old couches in it and we had to use space heaters to regulate our temperature. I mean, it's amazing. Uh, there were melted shoes on those space heaters, right? It's amazing we didn't burn down the building. But Donna kept saying yes to showing up in that classroom even after having to have her knees <laughs> replaced so that she could walk up the stairs and get to that back classroom. She had no idea. And, and, you know, Donna's husband, Cleo, allowed me to join his adult class, even though all of them were retired at that point when I joined. But St. James didn't have a young adult program. And Cleo not only asked me to join the class, he, he made me the substitute teacher. And all the people in the room tolerated the 19-year-old kid showing up teaching them about the Bible and Jesus. They've been reading this Bible longer than I'd been alive. But yeah, I can teach this class. Sure, why not? We have no idea what saying yes to God's call in our life will do in the future. And so our, but our response is to say yes with our prayers, our presence, our gifts, our service, and our witness. And it's not about how much of those things we have to offer. It's about offering what we are able to offer. So when it comes to presence, it's saying yes to showing up once a week in worship, three times a week, physically here in the building, online, just get here. And trust that if you get here, 
with the willingness to accomplish God's mission for us as a church, your getting here is appreciated and powerful and effective for the accomplishment of that mission. Say yes to praying for the church, whether it's one minute a day or 20 minutes a day, or you're retired and you're stuck in a chair and you have hours of time and so you give hours of time to praying for the church and our leaders. Whatever amount of time you have to say yes to, offer it and know that if you say yes for the purpose of accomplishing God's mission for us, it's appreciated and it's powerful and it's effective. Say yes to giving financially. I don't care if it's a dollar a week or $20 a week, $500 a week, $1,000 a week. I know right now it's hard to talk about giving because the economy is crazy, but we're all able to give something. And if we give out of a generous heart, no matter how much it is, if we give, if we give it to accomplish God's mission for Broadway United Methodist Church, it's appreciated and it's powerful and it's effective. We're called to say yes to volunteering, whether it's 10 minutes a week or 20 hours a week. Come and greet at the door before worship. Be the friendly face of hospitality that we just sang about. There's somebody who loves you here to greet you at the door. Come and do that. Hand out bulletins, click slides, learn to run the camera because Chris thinks he's allowed to go to college, so we need a new camera runner. Come fold newsletters. Come lead a small group. Come sing or play in the praise band. Come do liturgy. Come light candles. Whatever you have to give, if it's it's given to accomplish God's mission, it is appreciated and powerful and effective. Say yes to inviting people to worship, to telling them about the work of Broadway United Methodist Church, whether it's sharing a social media post or bringing them to church with you or inviting them to a special program, whatever you have to offer. So refrain now, if it's given to accomplish God's mission for Broadway United Methodist Church, it is appreciated and powerful and effective. We say yes to the call that God has for us because when we say yes to the call that God has for us, God does things that we cannot even imagine. We are all here because there's a long-standing history of people saying yes to God's call that got us here. We could all trace the lineage like I did for how we wound up with ourselves in these pews watching online, all because somebody else said yes to something that helped get us here. And we have no idea how long that impact will last well after our lifetime here on earth. And Broadway, you have a history, a proud history of saying yes to God's call. Did you know that when I got into ministry, they told us that a healthy church, a healthy church should produce a preacher every 25 years. That's what they were saying. Every 25 years, you should produce a preacher. Do you know how many preachers have come out of this church in the last 25 years? We've got Brian Milford, Brian Williams, Alex Bruning, Andrea Kroshauer, am I forgetting? Jim Devine is now one of our lay preachers. We've got lay preachers like, like Christy Waller and Shannon Meister who travel around to different churches and help fill in on Sunday mornings. Because you as a church keep saying yes, one of the things you keep saying yes to is, is come stand in front of us and give us your first sermon and we'll keep inviting you back. You've heard people's first sermons. If you could have heard my first sermon, you wouldn't have asked me to come serve here, right? Because the first one's always rough. It's never good. The theology and the maturity and the way of delivering sermons always gets better with time, but we have to say yes to the first ones, to being the people that allow the 19-year-old kid to teach the Bible class. You have a long history of saying yes. And the call today is to keep saying yes to God, to have the courage to say yes, even if it feels a little bit scary, to offer what you can offer with gladness and generosity, not to bind yourselves. I don't want you to bind yourselves in any way, 
to take up time that you need for work or to take funds that you need to survive, but to trust that regardless of how much time you have to offer or finances you have to offer or the type of gift that you have to offer, that it is all appreciated and powerful and effective for accomplishing the mission that God has for us here at Broadway United Methodist Church. Amen? Amen.